Good morning, Kingdom Rise Church. This is Pastor Ray, and I want to welcome each and every one of you, new and old, old and new, to the goodness of God, to the glory of God, to the house of God, to the move of God, to the power of God, to the love of God, to the purposes of the kingdom of God. This is the moment, this is the hour that the Lord is looking across the face of the earth to and fro, and he's looking for people with his heart, people with a desire, people with a hunger for more than what they see or know. And that's exactly what the house of God does. It encourages you, it gives you your vision back, or it gives you your vision for the first time. It will heal your heart, it will let blood pump back in your heart and you'll start to hope again and believe again. The house of God, there's no other place on earth like the house of God, the house of healing, the house of hope, the house of the miraculous, the house of provision, the house of vision, the house of power. But most importantly, it's the house of God. So I wanna welcome you this morning to the house of God and allow that power, that relationship that the Lord has so, so desires to have with you to continue to flourish and be developed today. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and start with prayer. Lord, we thank you for this season. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time. We thank you, Spirit of God, because you are a living God. And we, none of us, are too far from your hand. Lord, I ask right now that you would stretch down from heaven, that you would touch every son and daughter, release new things, remove old things. Speak to us today, Lord. Move powerfully. Speak clearly to us, God. Lord, I ask right now that I would be, that I would, what, that I would decrease, that you might increase spirit of God. Speak to your sons and daughters. Touch them. Change them. Transform them. That this might truly be your year of sitting glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Kingdom Arise Church, you know and I know that we continue to journey with our loving Savior, our amazing Savior, the only Savior, Jesus Christ. And we've done this through the Gospels, and we continue to find ourselves in the Gospel of Luke. We are in the Gospel of Luke, and we're actually in chapter 19, and we're picking up in verse 45. And what's happening here, as I want to kind of prepare the segue, what's, what we find ourselves in is a moment where Jesus is comes in in his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, sitting on the back of a colt, and the people are cheering, the people are worshiping, they're glorifying God. The Pharisees get offended and rebuke Jesus because of his disciples' praise towards him and their declaration of who he is in God as the authority, as the Messiah. And he says, look, all of creation is crying out. If humanity won't cry out for me, the stones will cry out for me. Everything that ever created continues to cry out for me. All the natural laws, all the natural forces that I put into work recognize who I am, but do you? And so from there we find Jesus and he approaches the Mount of Olives and he looks towards the old city of Jerusalem. And he compassionately begins to weep because what he knows is what humanity oftentimes fails to know, their own destruction. You know, the Bible says that pride comes before the fall and truly what happens, what happens in this moment is the Pharisees have postured their hearts. They have hardened their hearts. They have a desire to kill the Messiah from within. From within their hearts, Jesus has messed up their good gig, their good system, their system where they are propped up, where they are honored and worshiped, where they've become so acquainted with building their own kingdom with the covering of God's kingdom. And so Jesus looks to the city and he sees that in 40 years after his passing that the temple will come tumbling down and lives will be lost and great, great tragedy, great sadness will strike the nation of Israel. And Jesus begins to weep because he sees it. He's not even weeping for himself. And you know and I know what Jesus went through, at least we think we do. I don't think we'll ever fully understand. But Jesus doesn't weep for himself as he looks to the city of Jerusalem. He weeps for the city. He weeps for the sheep because they're sheep without a shepherd. They're lost. And the truth is, is that that still resonates. That still speaks to the heart of man, to your heart and my heart, our lives. 
our desperate need of God, whether we acknowledge it, whether we deny it, whether we're running towards it or running from it, we all have a desperate need of God. And God looks to you and I. And he's waiting. He's willing. He's most certainly able. And he wants to reach out, touch your life, transform your life, and use your life to let his kingdom be established on earth before he comes back in glory. So now we see the transition of the weeping from the triumphant entry on a colt's back to the rebuke and rejection of the Pharisees to the weeping of Jesus on the Mount of Olives. And now we find ourselves in verse 45 and we encounter another, another side of King Jesus. And then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So as verse or chapter 19 comes to a close, as we just finished reading, we find that Jesus goes from very radical and very intense expressions, intense emotions, intense insight, intense convictions. And I really believe that our Christianity requires a new level of intensity. I believe what Jesus is modeling, what Jesus lived, what he walked out is really the same convictions that we need to develop individually and corporately as the church of Jesus. We need to have that boldness. We need to have that conviction. We need to have that compassion, but also that authority. And we find that Jesus goes from weeping, heartbroken for the loss that the people have yet to realize. It's like these people are the walking dead and they don't even realize it. These people are already lost and they don't even, they're not even aware of it. But Jesus sees it. Why? Because God knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And we see this transition that he goes from weeping, from a deep compassion to a new passion, which is a passion for the house of God. We see him weeping in this, in this sensitivity to this anger, this holy fire, this zeal for the house of the Lord. And he goes and he steps in in 45 and it says that he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it saying to them, it is written, my house. Why does it say it is written? Because he's referring to the book of Jeremiah, in which it says that my house will be a house of prayer. So he's reconfirming the word of God. What I love about Jesus is Jesus does the will of the Father, but he's always confirming the word of God, the Bible. He's not reinventing the Bible. He's not trying to create his own uh, vernacular. He's not trying to create his own flow, his own ideology. He stays consistent because God is always consistent. And he's persistent. Why? Because God doesn't give up. That's why you can trust the Lord. Why? Because he is the wellspring of hope. And it's so important that we continue to find that wellspring, that we seek that wellspring, that we count on that wellspring, that we know, that we know, that we know that God is faithful. And so we find this Jesus who steps in from this low of this weeping and seeing the city, and I'm sure that he sees the city on fire. He sees people dying. It says that children are dying. And then he goes from that sadness, that truth, that reality that's soon to come to pass. And then he goes and he steps into the house of God, his father's house, his house. And he sees people and he sees all these animals making noises and, and defecating and, and eating. And, and, and there's just this chaos and it's become like a swap meet. There's, there's, there's animals everywhere. There's people everywhere. There's people, I'm sure there's people bargaining and haggling for things or selling things. There's all kinds of trinkets and just random things. People are selling food in the temple. The temple has become a swap meet and a complete disrespect and, a, and, and irreverence towards the presence of God in the house of God. So what does Jesus do? He goes from the, the low of the compassion, the deep inner weeping of his heart to a fire in his belly and an anger that says, this is wrong. This is not what is supposed to be done in my father's house. And if you people are so 
close yet so far away from my father's heart, I'm going to deal with it right now. He doesn't ask for permission. He steps with authority. He moves in authority and he starts to flip over tables. He starts to rebuke everybody. In other scriptures, it says that he actually was whipping people because, and he threw their tables out of the way. Why? Because he had a holy anger. We find what scripture calls Jesus, the lion from the tribe of Judah. This moment, at this moment, we find the roaring lion in King Jesus. We find the Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, moving in divine authority. Imagine as a parent, because I, want, I really want to bring this into our context, what Jesus experiences, his anger, his conviction. Uh, we, need to, we need to connect with Jesus. It's so easy to observe Jesus uh, from a distance that we don't, we're not in that spiritual splash zone. And so last week, the message was called Journeying with Jesus. And it's so important that as we read the Bible, that we find ourselves alongside of Jesus, that we find ourselves walking next to Jesus, that we're breathing in the air, the dusk, the dew, the heat, the, the dirt, the, the, that we take in every part, every sense is activated. Every part of us is engaged with what we're reading. And so, the Lord really has put in my heart that we need to identify with what Jesus felt when he stepped into that temple. What did he feel? And so I'm reminded of the convictions and the burden of a parent. And think of if somebody goes and tries to grab your child, what would be your response? What response would you have? How would you feel inside? Your earlobes would turn red. Your forehead would get hot. Your stomach would get twisted up and sick inside and you'd want to throw up and there would just be this need to fight back. There would be like that whole uh, dynamic that we hear very oftentimes we find stories where people are attacked by bears, right? And the bears that people oftentimes are attacked by is not a male bear, but a mama bear. Mama bears protecting their cubs. And I just believe that Jesus, when he stepped into the temple that day, he took the posture of a lion, but he had that, he had that same conviction as a mama bear, that same level of danger, where it was like, just don't mess with me. Nothing can stop me from bringing order and confronting this inconsistent character, this inconsistent portrayal of my house, this violation of my glory, this violation of my holiness, this violation of my purity. And so that same feeling that you would have if someone was trying to grab your child or do something to your child, that you would be, you would just, you would move, you'd be moved to action. You wouldn't sit there and say one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. No, you wouldn't, you would be automatic. It would be something that would be subconscious. You wouldn't have to think it through. It would be a response. And I believe that Jesus couldn't help as he looks at this amazing, amazing temple that was given in a vision specific instructions, measurements, every craftsman that was chosen, handpicked by God, every single measurement, every single material, every gem, every piece of gold, everything. This was a precious, beautiful demonstration of the glory of God. And Jesus approaches this building from the outside and it, and it says, I don't know if you're aware of it, but scripture says that there was a very big piece of gold on top layer covering the top of the temple and that from miles away that top of the gold when the sun would hit it it would radiate and almost blind you while the rest of the temple was made out of a white stone so you'd see this ivory tower this ivory temple that would stand out and you would see this gold beacon glowing during the day almost blinding depending on how the sun hit it and so Jesus approaches it and he steps inside the walls to see something very different Oftentimes, our lives are like this temple. Oftentimes, we look like we have everything together. Yet behind closed doors, our lives can oftentimes be very different. And I believe that God today sees your outside. He sees the outside. He sees the image. He sees how you want to portray yourself, how you pretend to feel at times, that you have it all together, that it's all good. And yet inside, you're 
drowning. Inside, you're a hot mess. Inside, you are, you are walking a life inconsistent with what you're speaking. Your walk and your talk don't line up. God sees those inconsistencies, and I believe for many of us, because of that, we avoid getting more accountable, drawing closer to God, being more involved in church because we don't want people to see our dirty laundry. And so we avoid it. We avoid the temple or we just live dual lives. We are hypocrites in a sense, intentionally, not willing to give God access to every part of our hearts and our lives. And so today we see this parallel that Jesus steps into this temple and he sees the stark contrast between the glory or the seeming glory and the dirty mess, the disorder, the irreverence that's taking place in his father's house. Jesus says with great conviction that you people have become, you have made it a den of thieves. These people, and remember something, who oversees the temple? The priest the high priest, the Sanhedrin, all of these religious leaders, why are they tolerating this behavior? You know why? Because it was good business. Good business. They were making good money and they were being honored. They were the ones getting all of the, uh, all of the kudos. They were sitting in the best seats. They were having their egos stroked. They were able to tell everybody how better they were than everybody else. And they were able to, what, instead of uh, serving, they were expecting to be served. They had a great deal. They were the creme de la creme. They were the socialites. And they allowed this perversion, this business mindset, spirit to, to become parasitic. Oftentimes I have shared in the past that what affects you can infect you. Let me say that one more time. In life, things that affect you can infect you. And what Jesus saw was that what had happened is that they, the leaven, right, the yeast, the unleaven of the Pharisees had now become a venom, a poison to the very church, the very house of God, had been poisoned. And that's why he referred to it as a den of thieves. They had stolen, they were stealing, they were prostituting, they were, um, they were ripping off and extorting the people of God in the guise of God. And it was a complete lie. It was an inaccurate depiction of what the temple really was meant to be. The original tent. The temple was meant to be a house of prayer. The book of Jeremiah talks about that. And Jesus just reconfirms it. That this is meant to be a house of prayer. You know, the altar, oftentimes we look to the altar and it's such a beautiful place. But the purpose of the altar isn't for it to be a place of beauty, but a place of transformation. The altar is the place where every single priest, every single person, irregardless of what function you have, what anointing you have, what mantling you have, what calling you have, the altar is the place where you must perpetually encounter God and continue to have your life altered by God. The day that your life stops being altered at the altar, something has broken away from the heart of God. Something has grown distant. Something has tried to entrench itself and encamp itself on the throne room of your heart. So we, each of us, as we serve the Lord, as we come to know God, we have to guard our hearts. The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart for it determines the course of your life. You and I today, God is, is in the fight and he's given you the victory, but you also have to do your part. There's things, there's giants in the land, there's, there's the 500 pound gorillas in the room that you have to confront with the authority of God, with the conviction of God, and have that same compassion for the broken, for the losses, for the carnage, for the collateral damage that you see. But at the same time, there has to be this fire and authority that's unlocked and only found in, in your godly identity to give you the victory in those areas of your life. So we find this parallel. And I draw this metaphor that I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to show you today. That oftentimes the church, we, be, we are very good at being plastic Christians, at being great performers, living from pre presentation to presentation, from performance to performance. But God doesn't need performance. He needs presence. Presence. His presence in you. And so when I think of the temple at that time, and I think about the New Testament covenant that Jesus Christ gave us through the cross, 
and in his resurrecting power and in his divine purpose, when he releases the Holy Spirit, he ascends, the Holy Spirit descends. What happens? We now become the house, houses, the vessels, the temples of God. That's why I can see the parallel between the condition of the old temple, which was, this technically is the second temple, because the first temple had already been destroyed. So this is already the, the Jewish people's second chance at a temple. But now we see God's third chance at a temple, God's third time, his third commitment to rebuild the temple. But now he's building the temple through people, not through buildings, through lives, through souls. God is taking us beyond the organizational church and he's reminding us our, of our original design, the organic church, the church of Acts, where people gathered in homes, where people provided for each other, where every need was met, where there was joy and unity and there was purpose and sacrifice and obedience. The common good, koinonia, the fellowship of coming together, ecclesia, the assembling of God's people and his presence among the people. Today, God, once again, I really believe as we continue to come out of this COVID process journey, what God is doing is that he's bringing us back to our first love. He's reminding us that we are the houses, we are the temple of God, that we are the church of God, that we are the family of God, that we're the sons of God, and there is an assignment, there's a stewardship, there's a passion, there's a hope, there is an authority that we need to start moving in again. And so if we look at the scripture, I believe that God is speaking to you and I today. And he says, is there areas of your life that are inconsistent that nobody sees? Are there things that you choose to ignore? Are there other things sitting on the throne of your heart where he is supposed to be seated? Or have you just kind of put a second throne right next to his with other hobbies, other vices, other areas of compromise, other sins, other inconsistent character traits. And God says, no, I need you to slay all of those today. I need to turn over the table of those areas of your life that you have been intimidated, comfortable with, and deceived by. And today, God is turning over the tables of those areas of your life because God wants to make your life, your body, your soul, a house of prayer, a temple of prayer, a beacon of prayer. Because if your house is a beacon of prayer, it becomes a beacon of purity, but ultimately a beacon of power. God wants to give you power back. He doesn't want you to feel powerless. God wants to do miracles through your life, but first he needs to do the miracle of healing your life, delivering your life, strengthening your life, equipping your identity, dealing with your character traits, dealing with your integrity, dealing with your ethics and your morality and bringing you into alignment and bringing you to a place of surrender so that you can sacrifice and be obedient and serve with joy, understanding that God has given, been merciful with you and you have gratitude in your heart. So when you have gratitude in your heart, you can't help but be joyful and hungry and have a conviction and a compassion towards the kingdom of God and his people. And so today God is speaking to you and I and he's turning over, he's turning things right side up, not upside down. What, what, the life that we live without Christ is the life that is already upside down. God wants to make our lives right side up. He's flipping things back into order. I really believe that God has more that he wants to do in 2022 than he's ever done before in and through our lives. What's that one area? What's that one thing? What's that one child? What's that one marriage? What's that one area of your life that you've been holding on to? Giving yourself the benefit to enjoy or giving you are too scared to even confront that giant in your life. And I believe that God wants to turn the tables on what the devil intended for evil. God is going to turn for good. The Bible says that God makes all things work for the good of those called according to his purposes. God is calling you back to your original purpose. That starts with a person of Jesus. That starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's not a relationship that happens every other day. That's a daily communion, a connection. Communion with God is a connection with God. It's a relationship. God is not building a church he's coming back for on the back of religion, but through intimacy and relationship, not in public areas, but starting in the private areas of your heart and your homes. 
And so today we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, because we study that and we continue to teach on that in our acronym of faith. And the first part of faith is finisher. God is the finisher. Jesus is the finisher and the author of our salvation, of our lives, of our journey, our progress as we prepare ourselves for the second coming of Jesus. And so we find here that Jesus calls out these den of thieves and he moves on from this rebuke and this alignment and this correction, so don't take it personal. Then he goes to what? Teaching daily. See, the truth is, is that God corrects you, but he doesn't stay mad at you. Oftentimes, as people, we have past experiences from our childhood, from life, where we try to put God in a box based off of our natural experience our empirical knowledge, our life experience. We impose our life experience and expectations based off our biological nurturing, our reality, our conditions. And what we do is we, we marginalize, we lower the level of what God can and is in and through our lives. And I just believe that today we see that from here, Jesus goes from weeping to rebuking to teaching. See, God weeps Look at the heart of God towards man. I believe this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful example in process of how God approaches and looks to each of and every one of his sons and daughters. When God looked to you and I and he knew that we were lost in our sin, he wept. But then he got mad and he had to bring order and he had to rebuke and he had to realign and he had to discipline but then from that discipline, he didn't stay mad at you. What he said is, get up, son, get up, daughter. And then what he wanted to do is he wanted to give you a new identity. So he taught. And today God wants to teach you. He wants to teach you new things, better things. He, wants to, he doesn't want to give you an average word. He wants to give you a better word. God wants to give you an eternal word, a word that you can eat for an eternity, not just for a moment. We find that God goes from weeping to a correction to teaching. And I love that about God. The heart of God towards us is not of anger, but a desire to protect us. And oftentimes we mistake discipline for protection. Discipline corrects and protects us. It's not to penalize us or punish us. We can do that on our own. God's heart towards you and I today is one of mercy, compassion, and grace. But we need to also respond to that grace with gratitude and so today, I believe that as we close, we are going to pray that God would continue to strengthen our temples, deal with our idols, remove whatever we've allowed to be on the throne or sit on the throne a room of our hearts where Jesus needs to be seated permanently so that we can truly manifest the glory of God, God's sitting glory in 2022. Let's pray. Spirit of God, it's been a tough journey. It's been a lot of hard moments, God. A lot of slow turning of the, of the hands of the clock, the ticking, Lord, the times, the resistance, the adversity, the hard times, the good times, God, all of them. It hasn't been easy. Sometimes we think or we felt lonely. But today, God, today, God, we need to dust ourselves off. The Bible says, though a righteous man stumbles seven times, he gets back up. And today, Lord, we ask that you would give us the ability, the authority, and the strength that we would activate it today, God. That we would activate a new lifestyle, that we would activate a new level of purity or consecration. And Lord, if people have, if people, if your spirit is called to house inside of us, to be housed by us, Lord, remove the idols, remove the sin. Give us a conviction and an anger to, to no longer tolerate generational curses, to no longer tolerate uh, seemingly innocent sin because there's nothing innocent about sin. Lord, we're called to purpose. We're called to more. We're called to house your glory and to manifest your power on earth. So today, God, we ask that we wouldn't just be beautiful from the outside, but the true oil, the true perfume, the true aroma of the kingdom of God and the power within would be manifest inside our hearts and our lives. Lord, today we speak blessing over the church. 
Lord, bless Kingdom Arise Church. Bless every family. Bless every sacrifice. Bless every, every offering, every tithe, every, every moment of, of, uh, of obedience, Lord. And Lord, we believe, we believe and we stand on your word that don't tire of doing good for in due season you shall reap what you sow. Lord, I declare that in 2022, families will experience new breakthroughs as we glorify you. So Lord, we just speak that you give seed to the sower. Give us more seed so that we can bless more people and establish your kingdom on earth. Make us the pure bride of Christ in 2022. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.